Good afternoon and welcome to our speaker series event. My name is Vaktan Kutkaradze and I am Vice President of Transformation Science and Technology for ATCO and I will be your moderator today. I would like to start by welcoming my colleague George Constantinescu, Senior Vice President and Chief Transformation Officer, who has uh, some welcoming remarks and will introduce our speaker. George, thank you so much for joining us today and I'll turn things over to you. Thank you, Voktang, and welcome all. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this session of our speaker series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are uh, present, wherever we uh, and you may be located. Uh, I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present in the communities and regions where we operate. We have a number of my colleagues on this call, as well as others from the academic community and business sectors. So a warm welcome to everyone joining us today. These lectures represent the chance for us to share and discuss knowledge and insights from thought leaders. Our aim is to provide ATCO's people and our network of peers, partners, and friends with information on promising developments, trends, and leadership in relevant fields. I am happy to announce that on June 3rd, we will be hearing from Professor Plaman Atanasov from University of California, Irvine. That lecture will be on electrocatalysis for generating green hydrogen and capture and conversion of carbon dioxide. Now on to today's topic. I'm thrilled that today's session will focus on how to predict difficult to find solutions to complex problems. Today's lecture will focus on the opportunities and challenges of wind energy, delivered by one of the lead experts in the field, Professor David Wood from the University of Calgary. Renewable energy plays a crucial role in ATCO's push for a wider adoption of renewable energy in renewables. We have invested in alternative and renewable energy solutions for the past 30 years. Our projects span renewable natural gas, solar, hydro, wind, and geothermal technologies, as well as our current uh, focus on hydrogen. A few uh, mentions include Fort Saskatchewan hydrogen blending, ATCO and Southern California Gas um, Company project uh, for hydrogen blending and ATCO's Clean Energy Innovation Park. With a brief snapshot now. ATCO's Clean Energy Innovation Park will establish Australia's first commercial scale renewable hydrogen supply chain, including a 10 megawatt electrolyzer capable of producing up to 4.3 tons of hydrogen per day, along with storage and delivery to end users. The CEIP is planned to be co-located with the 180 megawatt Warrandage Wind Farm in Western Australia's Midwest which will provide the renewable energy to power the electrolyzer. The project has received $28.7 million in funding from the Australian Renewable Energy Agency to establish Australia's first commercial scale renewable hydrogen supply chain. This lecture will be the first one in the series of lectures that relate to the enhanced understanding of the opportunities provided by the current and future technologies in renewable energy. Please stay with us for what I hope to be a lively discussion after Dr. Wood's lecture starting around 12.45 p.m. And now it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce our guest speaker. Our expert today is Dr. David Wood. Dr. Wood graduated from Sydney University with bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering and holds a PhD in aeronautics from Imperial College London. He spent over 20 years as an academic at the universities of Newcastle, Australia, with a break of one year working at NASA's Eames Research Center, California. He also has set up and run his own business in wind energy and continues to do so, uh, continue to do so until 20, 
2010, when he became the NSERC and Max Industrial Research Chair in Renewable Energy, uh, the position that continued until 2017. Dr. Wood is currently the Schulich Chair in Renewable Energy and the Director of the Wind Energy Institute of Canada, and is also an editor for three research journals in renewable energy. With that, I will turn it back over to Voktang to explain the format of today's session. Voktang. Thank you, George, for a great introduction to the speaker and this lecture. Again, I would uh, like to welcome to uh, all of you who have joined us. Uh, and this lecture is uh, the first lecture in the Atlas Speaker Series this year. We have a bunch last year. Um, as George has mentioned, the goal of this series is to provide ATCO's workforce and other listeners with the information on the most promising developments in the relevant fields, outline where the state of the art is now, and who the uh, are the leading experts in these fields, and what is possible to achieve in 10 to 15 years horizon. Um, before we get underway with this lecture, I would also like to remind you that this session is a one-way audio and video format. You can see and hear the presenters, but they can't hear you, which is not the greatest part of feedback. That is why we're encouraging you to ask questions. You can do so by using the question icon at the right of your screen. We will open up a question functionality roughly midway through um, Professor Wood's lecture. You can address all your questions to him. With this, I would like to pass the microphone to our speaker, Professor Wood. Um, great to have you with us. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much to everyone at ACO for this opportunity to talk to you about some of the work that I do. And what I will be talking to you about is in two parts. Uh, there will be a part at, which is actually the second part that involves my research at the University of Calgary. Um, but the first part will talk about some of my experiences as a director of the Wind Energy Institute of Canada, uh, which is a, a, is a research institute, but it is also a working wind farm, and I'll give you some experiences on that. Having talked about the wind farm, I'll go on to some of our research at the University of Calgary, which was actually a project at, that was that involved at code that finished uh, for me uh, about last year. So the outline of the talk will be, as I said, in two parts. I'm going to talk a little bit about wind farm operation and grid interaction, um, and this will be based on the Wind Energy Institute's wind farm on Prince Edward Island in eastern Canada. I'll give you some examples of the problems that we've had with the turbines operation, our gearbox and generator failures, issues with blade erosion, and then tell you a little bit about a very interesting project that's been underway for a number of years now at uh, the Wind Energy Institute, looking at how wind turbines can be curtailed for automatic generator control. Um, I'll talk much more about what I mean by those words when I uh, get to that point of the uh, presentation. And I'd like to acknowledge that the slides that I'm uh, showing you today were provided to me by Dr. Marion Rogers, who is the director of the research uh, at the Wind Energy Institute of Canada. Um, um, then I'm going to change gears and tell you a little bit about our involvement with a problem uh, associated with grid connection, and that is the issue of dynamic thermal line rating of power lines. And the idea of dynamic thermal line rating, as I will try to explain, is that the power carrying capacity of a power line depends how much cooling is available uh, for that power line at the particular time. And uh, generally speaking, the more wind you have blowing over a power line, the more cooling you get and the higher the power capacity of the power line is. And if that power line is connected to a wind farm, then um, that wind farm has also increased its power producing capacity at the same time. So there's a very nice connection between the idea of rating a power line depending on the wind speed 
heat uh, compared to the production of electricity, say, uh, on a wind farm that is connected to the power line. And this work is the PhD project of my student, Mohammed Abdul Hadi, who has just uh, finished about last year. Okay, so to tell you just a little bit about the Wind Energy Institute of Canada, you can see Prince Edward Island highlighted on the right there. And then we zoom in on Prince Edward Island on the right bottom, and you can see the uh, Institute's uh, location on the North Cape of uh, Prince Edward Island. It's actually the most northerly point of the island. Uh, the Wind Energy Institute was instituted in the 1980s. It has a mandate to promote research and development in wind energy, but it has an unusual structure in the sense that the main income that the Institute gets is actually from the five turbine wind farm that it owns on the North Shore of the North Cape. And here you can see on the left a photograph of the five, five wind turbines there. Um, and uh, this is turbine one, two, three, four, and five. So uh, I'm going to be telling you about some of the operational issues that we've had with those turbines. Uh, here is a list of them. First of all, major gearbox issues. Uh, only one turbine out of five has not been impacted by gearbox problems. Uh, for example, there were six gearbox replacements in 2018. Uh, leading edge erosion has turned out to be a major issue with the turbines on the wind farm. I forgot to say uh, on the previous slide that the turbines are two megawatt uh, wind turbines. They sit on towers that are 80 metres high and the blades are about 44 metres long. And what we're finding with those wind turbines is that there's roughly a three year repair cycle. In other words, uh, every three years we have to do something serious to repair uh, the erosion that's been caused to the blades. Now this is due to a number of uh, factors. One is the very high capacity factor of the wind farm. Uh, the capacity factor is the ratio of the average power divided by the rated power of the turbine. Uh, for wind farms in Alberta, typical capacity factor will be slightly less than 40%. Uh, on Prince Edward Island, especially during the winter, uh, we get monthly capacity factors of 80%. So we have a site that has a very high wind resource, and you probably noticed from the slide previously that it's on the coast. And so it's effectively an offshore wind farm. And particularly during winter, uh, there are times where we get uh, rain and ice rain coming onto the wind turbines and the droplets associated with those uh, forms of water are primarily responsible for the erosion. Then in summer of 2020, another, we had three generator failures and we had a blade replacement uh, that was necessitated by a crack in the blade. So I'm just going to go through uh, these examples of equipment failure just to show you what uh, some of the actual operational issues that are associated with wind farms. So starting with the blade crack, unfortunately, these photos don't actually give a good setting uh, for what you see here, but you can on the left see the crack there, which was about 30 meters long. And it was in the section of the blade closest to the hub, and it was transverse to the blade. And if you think about a wind turbine blade as a cantilever rigidly attached to the rest of the turbine at the hub and then being forced to bend uh, due to the uh, wind pressure on the blades, then you can imagine that a transverse crack is a major problem. And indeed it was. Uh, it necessitated removal of the entire rotor and removal of the entire rotor uh, involves getting a large crane to site because I mentioned the towers are 80 meters high. Um, Prince Edward Island doesn't have any cranes of that size. They have to come from Nova Scotia. They have to come across on the Confederation Bridge to Prince Edward Island. And that is a problem in itself because the bridge cannot take uh, these large uh, vehicles during the winter months. So it's only possible to do blade repair in the warmer months. 
months of the year. So even though the crack was in one blade, the whole rotor has to be brought to the ground and the whole rotor has to be replaced because when wind turbine blades are made, it's very difficult to accurately ensure that the blades have the same mass and the same center of mass. And if you've got something like a 20 ton blade uh, as part of a three bladed rotor and there are mass imbalances and center of mass imbalances, you can imagine some of the problems that are associated with that. So. When one blade out of a three bladed rotor has a crack in it that requires the rotor to be replaced, then the entire rotor has to be replaced. And you can imagine, you can, uh, if you can't imagine it, you can tell by this sequence of slides uh, how extensive an operation that is. And of course, you can imagine how expensive uh, an operation that is. Moving on, uh, we've ha also had problems with the drivetrain. So for example, here is an a, a case where one of the teeth on the high speed pinion in the gearbox, uh, which is a high ratio gearbox. I forget exactly what the typical ratio of wind turbine gearboxes are, but the maximum RPM of the blades is only about 20. Uh, generators run at something like 14 100 RPM, so that gives you a gearbox ratio of the order of 70. And you can see on the right how the whole tooth of uh, from that gearbox detached from the gearbox. Moving on to the blades, and this is the area of wind farm asset management that I'm mostly interested in because, as George mentioned in his introduction, I am an aerodynamics person and I'm fascinated by the way in which water droplets and dust and other features of the atmosphere actually impact on, around the leading edge of the blades and cause damage to the blades. So here, here's a little bit of a timeline for the blade issues that we've had on these turbines. So the, the five two megawatt turbines were commissioned in 2013. Uh, in March uh, the, of 2014, there was um, uh, there, there was um, some leading edge uh, paint failure, erosion and pitting was first uh, observed. It was repaired in 2014, uh, completed in 2015. Uh, again, later on in 2015, further problems were noticed. And in summer 2016, the turbine uh, manufacturer proposed to address these issues with leading edge protection. And the idea with leading edge protection, it has been used on aircraft propellers and other applications, is that some form of special either coating or paint is applied to the leading edge. So WeaCan began a field study with four different uh, leading edge protection products. Uh, sometime in 2018 that was. And then in summer 2019, uh, a number of those products had to be replaced. Unfortunately, I can't give you any more detail about those products because we had to sign non-disclosure agreements with the manufacturers to allow us to do the comparison assessment. And um, so this is just saying, restating some of what was said on the previous slide. Um, and then there was a physical inspection of the blades uh, using cameras on the ground and by drones. And uh, if you've got a spare few minutes uh, one Sunday afternoon, uh, have a look on YouTube uh, um, and search on drones and wind farms. And you'll see a whole bunch of really fascinating videos where drones are used to fly through a wind farm, take photographs of the blades, and then those photographs are inspected to assess the damage to the blades. That is the most common way in which wind turbine blades are assessed for damage at the moment. And um, that has to be done via photographs. It's not a particularly scientific process and it would be really nice to be able to better quantify the damage. Um, site characteristics are also monitored and you can see in the slide on the left some examples of the leading edge uh, coating that has been applied to a wind turbine blade.
Um, so generally, the the wind farm has experienced a three year repair cycle, and you can imagine uh, the cost of that is substantial. The lost power production uh, associated with that downtime is substantial as well. Um, just to reiterate, um, we're seeing those really severe problems because of the high average wind speeds and the high capacity factor, plenty of freezing rain events, and they seem to be increasing uh, with climate change. And that's also, of course, associated with it being a coastal site. Uh, we've upgraded the uh, weather sensors for the um, station for the farm. For example, you can see here a, um, oh, it's the type of anemometer. This is a um, ultrasonic anemometer uh, that measures in, in a lot of detail uh, the wind speed distributions. And just to fill in a little bit of space on the slide, you can see a, an example of ice that has come off one of the blades during the winter. So here's an example of doing some leading edge uh, protection repair. This is actually one of my favorites uh, for uh, of photographs of wind turbines. You can see uh, how the workers have access to the leading edge of the blade uh, when the turbine has obviously been parked. So the blades are stationary and they can work their way up at the tower and do those uh, protections or to do those repairs to the leading edge. The challenges are many. Um, it is very difficult to do the repair in any time of the year uh, apart from summer. It's difficult to get skilled personnel to the site. Uh, the preparation time can be expensive. And of course, the cost of, act of the actual repair and the downtime uh, can be substantial as well. And again, one of the things that really interests me as an aerodynamics person is uh, what impact does the repair have on the performance of the blades and the turbines? Because uh, a wind turbine blade cross section is an airfoil. You know, uh, uh, briefly, a wind turbine blade is a rotating wing, uh, an inverse to a propeller, if you like to think of it that way. So the airfoil performance in terms of its lift and drag is very important. Um, and in turn, high lift and low drag um, are associated with the design shape of the airfoil. And if you change that shape, and particularly if you have significant damage from leading edge erosion, for example, um, that can significantly change the performance of the turbine. But one of the interesting things that we're finding, and this is a project that has only started recently, is that we have the ability to do detailed analysis of the wind turbine performance. And we find that before and after repair of the blades, we haven't been able to notice a substantial change in the power production of the turbine. So these two curves show the power output on the vertical scale versus the wind speed. So this is a typical power curve for a wind turbine. And for later uh, in this talk, I'd like you to note that there's a substantial increase in the power output as the wind speed increases. But uh, in these two cases for turbine number one and turbine number five, um, there's some change, actually a decrease uh, in the performance after repair at low wind speed. At higher wind speeds, we haven't seen any major impact. And I don't have any good explanation for that finding. It's something that we're doing uh, further analysis on. Okay, now I'm going to talk about something that is different to asset management of wind turbines. Okay, so we should be right now in pre presentation mode. So what I'm going to be talking about now is um, uh, an issue of automated generator control. And the idea here is that uh, what's happening with uh, electricity systems around the world is that they tend to be losing some of the characteristics of the system that gives almost inherent stability to an electricity system. And you often hear about issues with system inertia. 
um, particularly in Western countries that are decreasing their amount of manufacturing and also decreasing the use of generators like coal-fired power station generators that have a lot of inertia. Uh, the electricity system tends to have less inertia now than it did say 20 or 30 years ago. So if there's any problem with the system, uh, it can respond in ways that are potentially unstable. And the idea of what's called automated generator control, and I will turn my pointer uh, laser pointer on to highlight that. The idea with automated generator control is how do you do fine tuning of the balance between electricity production and the load demand at that particular time? And because of those issues that I talked about and other reasons that I won't go into now, that's becoming important. And automated generator control needs to be done on very short time scales. And there are very few electricity generators that can work at those short time scales. And wind turbines is one example of that. Photovoltaics is another example. Battery storage can also be used for automated generator control as well. And the idea is, unfortunately, the, these slides um, are not uh, wonderfully uh, annotated. This is just the normal, supposed to describe the normal situation uh, with a wind turbine producing power. Um, this is a total wind power, uh, wind farm power from our wind farm, which is five times two, which is 10 megawatts. And the idea is that if there wasn't anything to do with automated generator control, we just uh, let the wind farm happily go along producing the power that you see there. Um, the Wind Energy Institute of Canada joined a consortium with the Alberta Electricity System Operator as part of that consortium to look at what happens or how you go about changing the power output of the wind farm by somewhere around about one megawatt. And the idea of that is that we can imagine the, that requirement to reduce the power output is actually a requirement that comes from the system operator. And so what we're looking at here is altering the uh, wind farm power output in response to a uh, control signal that is sent by the system operator. And what we have here is an example of that. Um, what we have, what you see in red, is the uh, capability of the wind farm to produce power as time goes on. Um, blue is uh, the automated generator control target power. And this target power was actually produced by the Alberta Electricity System Operator uh, to uh, they provided that to our wind farm so that we could do this experiment on seeing how to mitigate or to reduce the power output to match that. So the aim of the experiment was that instead of more or less following the red line, which is what the wind farm was capable of producing, what we're trying to do is to follow the blue line, which is given to us by the system operator. And you can see that each of the time intervals are on the scale is half an hour. So you can see that the requirement or the specification from the system operator is changing on a very short time scale. And the ability of the wind farm to follow that signal is shown in the grey lines there. So grey is the actual power output of the wind turbine in response to the blue demand from the electricity system operator. If you're particularly interested in that experiment, uh, there's a reference to uh, the work in at the bottom of the slide. And what you can do when you do that is to rate your performance in terms of how well uh, the grey line 
uh, follows the blue line and provides an error that's given by the yellow line at the bottom there. So we weren't perfectly able to follow the control, but we did pretty well. And by various uh, rating scores, we came in somewhere between 65 and 75 percent. And you can compare that to the typical performance scores. This comes from an American uh, system operator. I forget which one it can. And the benefit for the wind farm is that automated generator control will become another market opportunity for wind farm owners. So they will actually be paid to curtail their wind farm um, rather than necessarily producing the, the main, uh, the most power that the wind farm can produce. And where this work is going is that you can imagine if we're altering the control system of the turbine to match its power output to the AGC signal from the system operator, we're probably putting the turbine under extra stress. And we need to know what those extra stresses are and make an assessment about whether the additional maintenance and replacement costs caused by that is going to be uh, worthwhile compared to the income that would be generated from participating in. OK. Now I'm going to change tack yet again. So this is the second part of the talk and I'm going to tell you a bit about a research project that we were involved in that is ongoing in a small way but has mainly finished. Uh, this was a project that involved ATCO and uh, the project is about uh, an aspect of grid integration, the dynamic thermal line rating of a power line. So I've shown you an image of what a power conductor cable looks like. It is typically a helical wound uh, wire conductor. Uh, this is what's called a six by one conductor. There are six outside strands of the conductor wrapped around the middle strand, and you can see that it's, it's wrapped in a helical fashion. And the question that I am starting this part of the presentation with is the question, what limits the power carrying capacity of a power line? And the technical term for that is ampacity. And I'm sure quite a number of people on this uh, presentation will know the answer to that. But if you're not an electrical engineer, and I very quickly mentioned that I'm not an electrical engineer, I was actually totally surprised by the answer to that question question. And the answer to that question is that if you put too much current, uh, i.e. too much power through a power line, the power line might actually sag and hit the ground or hit a building that's underneath the power line. Uh, if you put too much current through it, you may also anneal the conductor, that you change the physical structure of the conductor and therefore change its res uh, resistance. So we got involved in this project that involved ACCO as well. Uh, the actual aim of the project wasn't specifically to do with wind farms, but the ideas that I'm going to tell you about actually have a lot of application to wind farms. And I thought I would leave it in that same context because of part one of my talk. And where all this comes from is that if you do a heat balance on a conductor cable, then the, con the conductor itself uh, generates heat by the mechanism of joule heating. Uh, the current and the resistance of the conductor combine to produce heat. And the amount of heat that is produced is a function of the core temperature of the conductor. Now that heat is generated internally within the conductor and that heat is convected away from the conductor due to any wind that is blowing over it. There is also a radiative heat transfer and that may be to the conductor or it may be away from the conductor. Uh, in many cases, uh, the radiative heat transfer is relatively small or even negligible. So that means that in many cases, the value of the current or the power that you put through a power line is by and large controlled by how much convective heat transfer you get to the wind. And the main features are the wind speed, 
um, the conductor core temperature and the ambient temperature. And of those, uh, the wind speed is the most important, as I will show you. And of course, uh, in case you didn't realise that I is the inductor current and R is the uh, resistor. And the idea that you get very quickly from that heat balance is that if the heat balance on the left hand side is dominated by convective cooling, as the wind speed increases, uh, you get more convective cooling and you can put more power through the power line. So the idea of dynamic line rating has become very attractive to the wind energy industry because as the wind speed increases, of course, a wind farm normally will produce more power. And um, what we found when we uh, got into the um, looking at how you decide on the heat transfer from a conductor cable, there are a couple of main important international standards, IEEE and the SIGRI standards. And both of those assess the uh, cooling capacity of the wind by using data for the heat transfer from a circular cylinder. And one of the reasons I showed this image of a conductor cable is to show that it's definitely not a circular cylinder. Also too, virtually all the information that's available for circular cylinders uh, was obtained at low turbulence. And the atmosphere, uh, particularly when the wind speeds increase, uh, is going to have significant turbulence. So uh, we concentrated as our contribution to the project to look at the differences between uh, what happens to flow over a cylinder compared to that of the cable, what happens to the heat transfer over a cylinder compared to that of the cable, and what are the effects of high turbulence. And as I've mentioned before, uh, this was my ex-student Muhammad Abdul Hadi's PhD thesis, and that was supported by a project from the National Science and Engineering Research Council with ACCO as a partner. Now, I realise I'm running out of time, so I'll try and get through this fairly quickly. And what we did, we did some experiments on the flow over conductor cables, and we did uh, computational fluid dynamics simulation to determine the heat transfer. And this image here shows that with a circular cylinder, the flow over it, which is from left to right, is dominated by vortex shedding from both sides of the cylinder. That vortex shedding is alternate and it goes by the name of Kármán vortex shedding. Theodore von Kármán was the first person to recognise it at the beginning of the 20th century. And that vortex shedding process has a huge impact on the heat transfer. So what we did for experiments is shown here. Uh, we had our model in a water tunnel. So the blue rails and the gray indicate the water that is flowing over that model. Uh, the model is mounted vertically and we, we put a sheet of laser light into the tunnel, either horizontally on the left or vertically on the right. And the water in that tunnel is seeded with very small particles. And with that laser light and the cameras that are indicated as two and three here and two here, um, we photograph at very high frame rate the particles as they're illuminated by the laser sheet. And from those photographs and successive photographs over very small time differences, we deduce the velocity at a significant part of the green area. It's called the field of view. And that allows us to make detailed maps of the flow field behind either a circular cylinder or a stranded conductor cable. So you can see here in the top of this graph, some of the cross sections that we, we uh, investigated. Of course, we did a circular cylinder as the baseline comparison. So here's a six by one cable here uh, that is not a large difference from circularity, but we also did a three by one cable uh, which has three strands and it is significantly different. And these different cross sections, of course, are as you go along the helix of the cable. And what we were interested in was to see how the change in the cross section uh, changed the vortex shedding process over these cylinders. And we did some lower order modeling of that vortex shedding process, which I don't have time to go into. And what we showed was that the different geometries actually had very little impact 
on that four deck shedding process. And if we look at the heat transfer, and I've probably got too much information on this slide to go through in detail since I'm trying to finish fairly quickly. What we found was that uh, what is plotted here is, a, is the Nusselt number, which is a non-dimensional heat transfer rate from the cylinder and the cables. Most of it comes from the front side of the cable. Um, when you have a cable compared to a cylinder, here's a cylinder here, there are very large variations uh, uh, due to the strands in the cable, but overall there was no significant uh, difference between the heat transfer of a conductor cable and the circular cylinder. Now these simulations as well as the measurements that I showed on the last slide were done at low turbulence level. So what happens when you increase the turbulence level? And this is where the research has got to. So we're talking about this at a conference uh, run by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers in uh, later this year, where Mohammed did some simulations where he increased the turbulence level to 24% and he found a substantial increase in the heat transfer. Some of that increase occurs towards the front and over the top and bottom of the cable, but a significant uh, component of that uh, increases the heat transfer at the rear of the cable. So what we think from these simulations that we really have to spend some more time investigating uh, what free stream turbulence does. 24% turbulence is a turbulence level that is typical of some uh, atmospheric conditions. Um, and the other thing that we need to check on is that everything that we did in Mohammed's project, we had the flow at right angles to the cable. What happens when the flow is uh, yawed or the cable is yawed to the flow? So here are our conclusions, which I've got to quickly in the interests of time. Um, we find that the flow over stranded cables is similar to that over circular cylinders. They have a slightly lower heat transfer in low turbulence than circular cylinders, but because the dynamic thermal line rating standards ignore the effects of free stream turbulence, they are conservative. And we believe and we intend to do further explorations of the effects of high turbulence uh, to see how the conditions in the atmosphere are likely to further increase the heat transfer rate. And of course, we have noted that um, uh, your flow should also be investigated. And with that, I'm going to uh, stop my presentation because that is the last slide and uh, go back to uh, Vactang. Um, thank you, thank you uh, for this great presentation. I, um, uh, we're now going to a Q&A uh, session and uh, um, I'm delighted to say that we have uh, uh, 20 questions already published. Uh, I will try to, uh, and the questions are coming in um, still. So uh, I would like to encourage the audience also to upvote their favorite questions. Because, so we know I will, I will roughly try to follow the order of the most popular questions um, as much as possible. So um, with that, let's jump in the first, uh, the most popular one, which uh, is from Ann Stewart. What are the benefits differences of horizontal axis and vertical axis turbines? Yes, thank you. And that's that's a very basic uh, and interesting question. Um, I could take I could take several hours to answer this. I'll try and and, and answer it in a couple of minutes. Generally speaking, uh, horizontal axis turbines are more efficient than vertical axis turbines. Um, however, there are some important niche areas where vertical axis turbines uh, can be can play a role. Um, one of those is uh, for small 
wind turbines because there are some advantages of vertical axis turbines. For example, they tend to be quieter uh, than horizontal axis turbines. But the state of the industry at the moment is that when you get into the megawatt size of wind turbines, uh, something like 99.999% of them are horizontal axis turbines. Uh, the technology has matured and it has matured on that horizontal axis, three-bladed upwind uh, layout, partly because they are the most efficient uh, designs that we know of. Um, another area where uh, vertical axis can be important is in uh, hydro turbines. Uh, extracting energy from rivers and tides and channels. And a lot of the designs that are becoming popular for that application are also vertical axis. So there are particular areas where vertical axis has an advantage, but generally speaking for the uh, wind energy industry as we know it at the moment, uh, the preference is certainly for the, for the large horizontal axis ones. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, so uh, another question which uh, gained popularity the last few minutes, I guess, uh, is uh, are there any problems with flocking birds hitting the turbine wings? Um, there certainly can be and in southern Alberta it seems that it can be more of a problem of bat, of bat death and bat injury with wind turbines. Um, it's there are situations where it can be important. For example, I know uh, in Australia of, e of examples where wind, uh, wind farms were prevented because they were possibly impacting the habitat of migrating birds. Um, and there, yes, so there are specific situations where it's a problem. In general, it's, con it's considered not to be a major problem. The sort of numbers that you hear for Canada is that turbines like the ones that we saw in my presentation, typically a turbine of that size might kill five to 10 birds a year. So it's unfortunate, but it's not an overwhelming problem. And I think that's generally the case around the world. Although, as I said, um, it, uh, it it is very much site specific. Um, Vaktang, do I have time to add to that? Or do you want to? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we have until uh, 1.30 planned. Okay. Uh, but you can... Um, yeah, you can one, elaborate, of course. Okay, uh, in which case, this, this, this is very, this is a neat, um, sort of uh, transdisciplinary uh, observation. Um, one of the very interesting things that it was actually biologists from the University of Calgary uh, who did a survey of bat deaths uh, in wind farms uh, in southern Alberta. And they, they found something like 80 dead bats. And the vast majority of those bats had no physical damage. OK, so the bats didn't actually hit the wind turbine blades. And that, that has led to a theory of what's called barrow trauma. Barrow, B-A-R-O, um, barrow as in barometer to measure pressure, barrow added to trauma. So the idea is that um, it's not only impact of bats and birds that kills them. If a bat gets close to a wind turbine blade, um, then they see the pressure field that's generated by that wind turbine blade. And for reasons that I'm not sure of, because I'm not a biologist, um, the respiratory mechanism of bats is supposedly very sensitive to pressure changes. And so the theory of barrow trauma is that the bats are actually killed by the pressure field of the wind turbine blades. Now, about a year ago, um, I reviewed a paper for a uh, wind energy journal that was uh, written by aerodynamics people like me that did calculations of what the typical pressure field of a wind turbine blade is. And they argued that the level of the pressure was too small to actually kill most species of bats. 
So it's very much an open question. What uh, is the uh, mechanism of death for these poor bats? My, my particular theory, and this is totally uh, a personal opinion, is that they get frightened to death because the tip of a wind turbine blade travels at somewhere between 70 and 100 meters per second. And the sonar mechanism of bats, the bats that uh, catch insects, are used to insects traveling at much, much lower uh, frequency or much, much lower speed. So if for some reason they come into the proximity of a, to them, a huge thing called a wind turbine blade that is traveling much faster than anything that they're used to, I wonder if they just sort of get sensory overload and, and die as a result of that. So anyway. So Very it's a long, long answer to an interesting and, question. And if I may uh, follow up, um, and I know you are not a biologist, so maybe that's not a fair question to ask, but did you hear, uh, with this low number of uh, bird death, uh, did you hear about a uh, possible change of migratory uh, patterns for birds and the corresponding bi biological um, influences that may be quite severe for particular. It, it might be quite severe and with with global warming, um, you know, you would be very foolish to, you know, to say anything like if your wind farms are not in a migratory path at the moment, then, then it won't be for the supposed lifetime of the wind farm for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, OK, um, the next question is um, from Brandon M. Um, why was this uh, this site chosen given the logistical challenges versus Nova Scotia? I think that's probably about PEI installation. What are yep. the average number of days in operations per year or average annual number of days of downtime for repairs? Um, good questions. Uh, the last parts I don't know the answer to. Um, I have the the figures have come to me because um, because part of my responsibility as a director, of course, is to to know that. But I I, I should have I should have uh, written that information down and brought it with me, but I didn't. Um, but the question actually uh, raises an issue that uh, if we had longer for the presentation, I would have talked about. And that issue is that most of the wind farm owners didn't appreciate the sort of problems that I was telling you about. They didn't, they didn't, sorry, they didn't anticipate those sorts of problems. Um, if you talk to a wind turbine manufacturer, they will tell you um, that they're selling you a product that will last for 20 years. You know, that's a typical uh, um, lifetime, supposedly, of a wind farm. And uh, even though the conditions in southern Alberta are not as severe as they are on Prince Edward Island, the wind farm owners in southern Alberta are also having major asset management problems. I had a, another PhD student a number of years ago uh, who worked on failures of generator bearings. And um, and that were, that's a, a significant problem uh, in southern Alberta as well as Prince Edward Island. Um, the, the so part of the answer to the question is that the Wind Energy Institute did not anticipate the the the, the extent of the damage that uh, we have seen in that presentation. Um, having experienced it, of course, there is an upside. The damage is due to the fact that those turbines uh, are, are running at capacity factors that are probably close to world records. You know, the, you know a typical wind farm uh, in the US and Canada has a capacity factor of around about 40% or less. Uh, the PEI, the Wind Energy Institute wind farm has capacity factors for some months at least double that. So, you know, even though we're having uh, severe maintenance problems, we're also getting a hell of a lot of income from the turbines when they are actually operating. And serendipitously, of course, because we're a research institution, we're at the forefront of the problems that every wind farm owner in Canada is experienced to some extent. So, you know, we're not we're not anticipating and we're not necessarily enjoying the problems because I can give you a lot of stories about 
the complexities of dealing with manufacturers who source generator bearings from uh, a different manufacturer because their usual manufacturer had to shut down because of the tsunami in Japan in 2011. So they bought generator bearings from a Chinese manufacturer with a different level of warranty to, to what the Japanese provided. And we ended up going to court over issues like that. So, you know, it's an incredibly detailed uh, and long story, um, but it's an absolutely fascinating one. Um. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, a very popular question from Simon Pang, and uh, it is uh, um, it's about uh, his own work experience at Atco. So I'll read it. Um, Hello, Dr. Wood. I'm a structural engineer at Atco Electric designing and maintaining telecom towers. We have encountered issues about vortices generated by wind turbine blades and caused fatigue failure in one of our towers. I, would I was able to find some literature on, uh, but not in depth discussion on this topic. I wonder if you could give me some directions or links where I can do some research on this. Thanks, Simon Pang. Um, I think I can because um, one of one of my uh, interests is towers for small wind turbines rather than large ones and uh, lattice towers and other types of towers are more common than they are for large wind turbines so i'm fairly familiar with uh, a lot of the tower technologies um, i think simon the best thing to do would be to take this offline because i can't think of a way of responding specifically to your question um, without really diving into the details of it so um, if if you you can get my email address from the title slide or Vactang has it. Uh, you could pass on if, if you would like to um, email me. I'll, I'll uh, find some information for you. Great, thank you very much. And Simon, please uh, contact me if you have trouble finding uh, David's information online. Um, thank you. Uh, OK, the, the next question, let me just scroll up. Um, yeah, here it is. Um, Curious uh, what wind speeds uh, these are designed to. I think the, the question is about wind turbines. Uh, and these are the, the um, it's about 1227 PM. So it was um, close to middle of your talk. So when you um, you were talking about the, the damages and, and uh, things like that, how would a major hurricane impact the turbines? Uh, excellent question, yes. Um, it would. To commercial turbines are classified into, I think it's five different classes. And those classes, uh, four of those classes have specific values of the extreme wind speeds and the design speeds and whatever. It's a little while since I've looked at the table, so I can't remember the actual number. But there is a special fifth class uh, that is meant to account for situations like uh, hurricanes. Um, so uh, what is the background, the, the basis or the backbone of design for hurricanes is to ensure that the turbine is parked when the hurricane hits. In other words, if the turbine is operating when a hurricane hits, it's more likely to cause damage to the blades. But if you can actually park the turbine, um, apply the brakes, uh, keep the blades stationary, then it's relatively easy to have a turbine that uh, structurally will cope with those uh, wind loads. And so the uh, the other side, of course, of that strategy is that hurricanes tend to be more predictable than other uh, wind events. So usually you get um, pretty good notice that a hurricane is going to blow through your wind farm. And so you can take those uh, defensive measures. So it's a combination of additional structural design to cope with the high wind speeds, but it is also based on uh, anticipating that you're going to know when a hurricane is going through your wind farm. Thank you. Uh, next question is, um, uh, what are the limitations of wind turbines working in extreme cold temperatures less than minus 40 C? 
Uh, well, extreme is the operative word there. Um, I can't give you a general answer or a, a specific answer or detailed answer because my knowledge of low temperature is uh, fairly general. Um, it, it, if you're interested in the area generally, um, there's an International Energy Agency task force on wind in cold climates. So if you Google IEA and cold climates, you will get to the front page of that task force that has been operating for a long time now and has done a lot to quantify the issues associated with material behavior in cold temperatures, et cetera, et cetera. What I don't know is how far that extends into those extreme uh, cold temperatures that you quoted. So that that that's one air, one thing that I that I don't know about. Obviously, associated with cold weather is icing issues, and um, the wind farm owners in eastern Canada have substantial issues with icing, um, mainly freezing rain associated icing. And one of the problems with icing is that it very rarely uh, ices the blades equally. So it's typical for an operating turbine that uh, counters an icing event for the blades to be iced differently. And that, of course, introduces the sort of uh, mass and center of mass problems that I talked about uh, in my presentation. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you stop your turbine during an icing event, then obviously, or in anticipation of an icing event, you, you lose power production and you also uh, can get the situation that your blades will end up with more ice on them after the event than if they had kept rotating or kept operating. And so there's quite a big discussion in the wind industry about whether uh, for most icing events, you're actually better off to power through the event or whether you should actually shut down uh, for safety reasons. But that I, I emphasize also that that's um, the case in Eastern Canada. Um, we rarely get in Alberta uh, those sorts of uh, icing problems because we have a much drier climate. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is interesting and uh, connected to the next question. Um, is there a regulatory body for wind turbines that dictate inspection programs and frequencies? How often would drone inspections occur? Yearly, monthly, bi-yearly, etc.? That's that's a very good question. That that's also uh, relates to what I was saying earlier. Um, that one of the problems with these gearbox and generator failures and uh, blade erosion problems is that most of the wind farm owners didn't anticipate that they would have these problems. So at the moment, there's no um, regulatory. Uh, aspect to blade uh, repair or generator replacement, uh, apart from a few very basic uh, standards like you know the standards that would apply to the individual components. Whether that will develop over time, I'm not sure of. I suspect um, what's happening is that uh, the wind farm owners that have been hit in the face with these problems are uh, dealing with them both individually and collectively. Uh, I know the Canadian Renewable Energy Association um, has a big, um, not a task force, but a big interest in these sorts of issues. And they actually have a yearly conference on operations and maintenance uh, where these issues are discussed. Whether they end up getting codified, I don't know. And that's an interesting comparison to the situation for wind turbines themselves because you will, nowadays you will never sell a, a multi-megawatt wind turbine unless it's been certified to the appropriate international electrotechnical uh, international electrotechnical uh, commission uh, standards, and that's a, that's a very expensive process for the manufacturers to go through, but they have to go through that to guarantee the turbines, so that uh, a wind farm 
uh, proposer or a wind farm developer can use that information to get finance uh, from a lending institution. But that's it is an interesting question how how that will carry over to the the maintenance and whatever. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, there is a question from Arash Korami. Uh, has there been any consideration in the asset management plan of the wind turbines for the environmental impacts, like the threats uh, which might be imposed on wildlife from the high speed rotating blades? Any remedial action to minimize such issues? Um, yes, yes and no. I mean, most, most wind farm developments require environmental impact assessments along those lines. Um, and then there's been a limited number of studies subsequently that have actually aimed to uh, quantify the impact that wind farms had. And that, that bat death study in southern Alberta that I told you about earlier, that's an example of that. Um, the upshot of all that is that the the general consensus is that uh, wind turbines do not kill many birds. Yeah, you know, and the number the number of five to ten birds per turbine per year is a figure that I heard um, in a talk by a biologist who is uh, directly involved with a lot of those environmental assessment and those impact assessments. I, I think you know what what has got publicity in terms of the impact of wind turbines on wildlife has been a few extreme examples that uh, do not uh, directly correlate with the general uh, uh, effect in the industry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and then uh, the next question is related to the previous one, but it's more on the if you want economic side. Um, or engineering side. Um, thank you for the great presentation. You mentioned uh, that at the Wind Energy Institute of Canada, we have seen a leading edge repair cycle of two to three years. Do we see the same leading edge repair cycle at onshore facilities, or is the time frame potentially impacted by atmospheric salinity? Yes. Um, uh, the, I, I haven't worked with any wind farm owners in Alberta on this problem, but the anecdotal evidence that, or what, what I've been told is that they do have erosion problems, but the timescales of them are much greater uh, than what, I, what we found on Prince Edward Island. My guess is probably closer to eight to ten years. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, thank you. Um, there was a question uh, here. Um, uh, that is a very interesting question. What are the challenges on spent uh, slash scrapped uh, turbine blaze disposal? Ah, that that there there is the elephant in the room for the wind energy in, uh, industry because. <laughs> Wind turbine blades are made from conventional fiberglass. They're actually a cheap form of snowboards because snowboards typically have a lot of carbon fiber in it. Uh, wind turbine blades tend to have very little carbon fiber because it's too expensive, but they are a combination of petroleum and fiberglass, uh, so petroleum resin and fiberglass. And so a 30 ton wind turbine blade is typically 30 tons of solid petroleum. Um, there are no uh, good ways uh, to recycle those products. And in a lot of cases, um, uh, decommissioned wind turbine blades end up in landfill, which is a very poor image, if nothing else, uh, for the wind turbine industry. Again, if you have a little bit of spare time, uh, do a Google search on an organization called Rewind, and that's R E hyphen wind. And this is an organization that is looking at how you can repurpose uh, wind turbine blades. And uh, they have done things like uh, build pedestrian bridges out of wind turbine blades. And there's even what I think is a slightly crazy project to turn wind turbine blades into utility poles. So there is, but there's only a very limited amount of repurposing that you can do. Um, 
the industry is extremely concerned about this issue and is doing a lot um, to avoid it. Um, there's, there's basically two things that can be done. One is to change the resin and what is being developed are things like bioresins, so resins from natural materials which would at least cut down the life cycle cost of the resin, um, or alternatively to develop what are called thermoplastic resins. And uh, conventional resins are thermosetting resins. You make your wind turbine blade in a mold out of resin and fiberglass, and then you cure it. Okay, a thermoplastic uh, resin actually melts at high temperature. So in principle, uh, if you can manufacture your wind turbine blade out of a thermoplastic resin, at the end of its lifetime, you can melt it down and start again. And it's not quite as simple as that, but the idea is there. The other thing that is happening is people are looking at natural reinforcements for wind turbine blades as an alternative to fiberglass. And I um, have a little bit of involvement with that because I work uh, with a group at a university in Brazil that is on the edge of the Amazon rainforest. And you can imagine the Amazon is a major source of potential uh, alternative materials for uh, reinforcement of wind turbine blades. So people have looked at flax, for example, they've looked at hemp, um, and my colleagues in the Amazon are looking at a whole range of locally produced alternatives uh, for the reinforcement. So it is, it is a huge issue. Uh, how to recycle and repurpose wind turbine blades. Uh, the situation is not satisfactory at the moment, but hopefully when bioresins and thermoplastic resins um, are developed to the stage where they have comparable material properties to petroleum resin, we'll see a very rapid change in the way wind turbine blades are manufactured. Uh, thank you. So if I understand correctly right now, um, the lifetime of uh, of a used blade turbine in a in a trash heap is basically infinitely long I mean do you do you have any it, estimates no of, I don't but uh, I I think you can uh, you can take it as a very long time yes yes yeah thank you um well it, very interesting thank you and related to that question is uh, uh also another elephant in the room uh, for wind energy how many years does it take a wind turbine to become carbon neutral um, typically about six months. I see. Um, it, but that, it, uh, it, um, it, yeah, I mean, um, that's, that's a number that you see. The other numbers that you see are the, ener the embedded energy cost and the embedded emissions. Um, you know, mo a lot of people listening will, will know that um, coal-fired produced electricity uh, uh, corresponds to about a kilogram of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. The number that you see for wind turbines is typically between five and ten grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. So there is there is an embedded uh, uh, greenhouse gas cost, uh, partly associated with the blades because they're the least recyclable uh, material in a wind turbine, but it's orders of magnitude less than uh, the conventional sources and also significantly less than photovoltaics, which tends to come in somewhere around about 20 grams per kilowatt hour. Thank you. Um, so we are approaching uh, the end of our uh, uh, our discussion. Um, in 13 minutes and the, the questions are still coming. So I'm, I'm very grateful to our listeners for staying on the call. So maybe two or three more questions, depending how long okay. it will um, take to answer. And I apologize if we don't get, uh, we still have 20, 20 questions left. So I'm, ha I'm happy to answer by email for anyone that doesn't, doesn't uh, get a turn today. Thank you. So the next question is, um, how has the capacity factor CF uh, changed as the uh, as the turbines age? I have read that post 10 years of operating most offshore wind farms, CF decrease. 
Yes, they will, but it depends a lot on how the maintenance is undertaken. Because, for example, if you delay uh, repair of your blades for leading edge erosion, ultimately that will have significant impact on your power production. Uh, of course, uh, aside from the erosion, which uh, gives very large changes to the surface of the blade, you're going to get um, other effects of the droplet impingement on the blades as well, which will rough them, roughen them up and, and reduce the power production. Um, you also, of course, get wear on the generator and the gearbox, and that will eventually increase or decrease the efficiency of those devices. Um, I don't know, I haven't come across any typical um, degradation factor. And I think that's probably because offshore wind farms are relatively recent. And so that data just has, hasn't accumulated, or at least it hasn't been um, promoted or percolated through the wind uh, industry to the extent that I've found out about it. So certainly you would expect a decrease in performance with time, but exactly what you would expect, I don't know. Um. Thank you. Um, so uh, I, there was another question which I think you uh, you will really enjoy. Um, has there been any thought to embed sensors into turbine blades in order to monitor blade integrity and wear? Absolutely. There, it's it's a big industry, you know, because the, the wind industry itself is large and uh, worth a lot of money. And if you think about um, a uh, a, a wind turbine blade costs about ten dollars a kilogram, or ten US dollars a kilogram to manufacture. Um, the the big uh, offshore wind turbine blades now are, are thirty tons, so that's about three hundred thousand dollars per blade, um, and that is a, a high cost compared to the cost of many sensors. So you see a lot of people coming up with ideas for acoustic sensors, um, vibration sensors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that you can mount on wind turbine blades, uh, possibly also with the data acquisition system within the blade and some form of telemetry to get it to a, um, a centralized data acquisition system. But I, over, particularly over the last few years, I've seen quite a lot of, um, of uh, ideas presented for, for different types of sensors. So I think, I think it's going to happen more and more. Um, you know, uh, the wind farm owners are, are appreciating the challenges that they face with leading edge erosion, etc. Um, so I, I think it will become commonplace. At the moment, as far as I know, uh, it is not common for large wind turbines and particularly offshore wind turbines to have those installed on the blades, but I think that will change. Perhaps something to do, um, I guess. In the Sorry? I, I find this fa question fascinating, uh, you yeah. know, based on my own uh, uh, research interest. I think maybe something to do for all, yes. of, all of us. And yes, I mean, it, it, it's a great challenge. How do you produce uh, a relatively cheap sensor that can be used in relatively small numbers uh, yeah. to, to give you important information? Yes, and, yeah. and get rid of all the noise around it at the same time. Um, so next question um, uh, is from Ananda Ar um, Arumugam, I hope I pronounced it correctly. What factors are considered to decide the spacing and orientation between wind turbines in a wind farm? Ah, they, that's one of the biggest research areas in wind energy um, because it because a wind turbine extracts kinetic energy from the wind, uh, if you have a wind turbine behind another one, the second one is going to produce only a fraction of the power that it can uh, would otherwise produce. So the layout of wind turbines in wind farms is extremely important. And wind farm developers spend a lot of time and effort in getting uh, their best possible layout. So the procedure usually is something like um, the wind resource will be assessed 
on the wind farm site for at least a year to get an idea of the seasonal variations. Then there would be a computational fluid dynamics analysis of the wind flow, and that is combined with um, a optimization of the layout of the wind turbines in the wind farm uh, to get the arrangement that causes the least interference between the turbines or in other words maximizes the energy production but it is a major uh, step in a uh, wind farm layout and what has been found is that it's become more important with offshore wind farms because uh, what happens uh, when a wind turbine extracts energy from the wind, eventually that energy will be effectively replaced by uh, the high energy uh, air particles from other parts of the flow getting absorbed into the wake of the wind turbine. So the wind will effectively re-energize re itself if you give it enough space and time. However, for offshore wind farms, um, first of all, the turbines are larger uh, the topology is much simpler, so the airflows are much simpler. And people are finding that offshore wind farms can be 10 kilometers apart. And if one offshore wind farm happens to be upwind of another one, it will actually reduce the power output of the second wind farm. Okay, exactly. even, even over distances of tens of kilometers. It's, it's, a, it's become a big issue uh, with wind farm uh, operation in general and wind farm layout in particular to minimi minimize those effects. And if you get if you get interference between different wind farms, um, that's a challenging, challenging problem and a very interesting yeah. one. Um, the, the upshot of all that is that you can imagine uh, most parts of the world, you will in theory get wind from all directions. Uh, but typically there's a prevailing wind direction. So uh, in Alberta, it's sort of southwest to northwest because of the Rocky Mountains. So um, it's generally impossible to lay out a wind farm to avoid, uh, totally avoid any interference, but it can be minimized. And mm -hmm. an interesting corollary of that is that whenever you visit a wind farm site, you can often tell the prevailing wind direction uh, because if you see a line of wind turbines in a wind farm, you can bet that the prevailing wind direction is at right angles to that line which direction you don't know, but you know it to within a plus or minus sign. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think, unfortunately, we probably um, have to shut down uh, this very interesting discussion. We're barely making a dent and there's a um, there's still 17 questions left unanswered. So um, so I, I think I, I would invite people who really would like to have um, an answer uh, to perhaps um, use uh, Professor uh, Wood's generosity and uh, pro and uh, a right a right to him if it's possible.